Hello everyone, this is Tim Melvin of the Tim Melvin Deep Value Report and the Banking on Profits newsletter coming to you from a very rainy weekend down here in Central Florida. It was a beautiful and fantastic 4th of July, great neighborhood party and fireworks, but we've pretty much dealt with rain since then. Uh, and improving, I may not be a great market timer, but I am a fantastic weather timer as even though I really love going over there, I turned down not one but two invitations to the Daytona 500 this weekend. And those poor folks have spent all of last night and most of today sitting in the absolute pouring rain and running from thunderstorms. I guess they just concluded the race under rainy conditions. Um, but anyway, we missed that on that. So, big surprise, the stock market was up in the holiday shortened week by almost 1.5%. Uh, the great headlines job number that came out really drove buying throughout the week. Um, the ADP report was very, very strong when it came out earlier in the week. And, of course, the jobs number, you know, 280-some thousand jobs was a great headline number. Still a little worrying when you actually dig down in and read the report before pushing the buy button. Um, we saw a very large decline in full-time employment and an increased swelling of part-time employment. Now, some of that's due to summer hiring, I'm sure. But it's still very disturbing. There's very little wage growth year over year in these reports at this point either. So continuing along. It's better than it was, folks. That was It's a good number. People are at least working somewhere. Um, but it's not a great number. We're still a long way from a full economic recovery. But we did hit and hold Dow 17,000. So everybody can break out their party hats now and uh, wave them around. I'm sure they did on TV on Thursday. I unfortunately didn't have it on, so I get, didn't get to see the Dow 17,000 hats. We're just in a period of very, very low um, investor enthusiasm, I guess, which is a lot of complacency. Uh, volatility is very, very low as money just pushes the market higher a little bit, which is grinding higher on a continual basis. Right now, the big fear is not of losing money. It's of missing out on the rally. So people are continuing to put money into the market. <coughs> Of course, we don't market time, so we'll see how all that works out. We're just going to watch it and ride along with what we have. Now, here we go, folks. Earnings season starts Tuesday. Everybody's going to sit around and watch and wait for Alcoa to kick things off Tuesday evening. Uh, they should actually have a pretty decent report, I'm told. But uh, here we go again. The silliness and craziness of making massive decisions based on a three-month snapshot of a corporate's uh, lifespan, corporations' lifespan. It's just insanity. Billions of dollars of market cap, trillions most likely, will be added and subtracted from various companies based on a three-month cycle in time. It's insanity. Even worse than that, tens of millions of dollars, and again, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, are going to be diverted from the trading accounts of the 95% of people who wish they could trade to the 5% of people who are actually really good at this short-term trading business. Trading's Trading on earnings season is just its crazy. You're making a bet on how close somebody else's guess about sales and profits for a corporation over a three-month period of time turns out. That is craziness. Add the leverage of losing options, and a lot of folks are just going to lose a lot of money. We're going to take the different approach. We're not going to try to react, I mean predict, I'm sorry, to anything that happens in earnings season. I have no idea what will happen in this uh, next four-week free-for-all. What I will do is stay positioned to react to when something does happen. Quite often during earnings season, you'll get a company uh, will miss Wall Street's earnings as estimates, and everybody's going to run to sell the stock. Oh, my goodness, they only made half as much money as they thought as we thought they would, they lost money when we thought they'd make money, and oh my goodness, we have to sell this stock. Often you end up with this really high quality collection of assets that suddenly becomes available at a tremendous discount. It's huge opportunities uh, for value-oriented investors to sit back during earnings season and wait. We're going to just we're going to act like vultures. We're going to be vulture investors. And we're going to profit off of other people's misfortune. We get these, you know, every other quarter or so that are just incredible opportunities, and they made us a lot of money. You know, last year, uh, Starbuck missed uh, 
their estimates and the shipping company plummeted. We jumped in, we grabbed the stock, it rose 95% in less than six months. Late last year, we were able to jump on board Stargas when that shipper missed their earnings estimate and Wall Street dumped the stock out pretty hard and we're sitting on about a 35% gain in those shares right now and yeah, they've still got higher to go in my opinion. Uh, earlier this year, one of the best earnings season trades we've had in a while was Boardwalk Pipeline Partners missed earnings estimate, cut the dividend, it had been a high-yield MLP, and everybody just flocked to sell the stock. The thing just fell right out of bed. Well, if you knew anything about the company or had taken the time to understand what you own, you had to know, first off, this was a tremendous collection of pipeline assets. And secondly, it was owned by Lowe's, which is controlled by the Tish, Tish brothers, and they weren't letting this thing just go down the tube. They immediately stepped up, committed the money that was needed to finance uh, the operations going forward. That stock's already up 40%. We've only owned it a few months. So that's been a fantastic result. Hopefully, we'll see some of that this earnings season, and there'll be some opportunities to get some more money to work. I was talking with some friends the other night, and they asked me, what do you think of the stock market? And it's my stock answer, I really try not to. Right now, the market for us has come down to, in the last couple of months, net-net stocks, small banks, and small real estate investment trusts. That's where we've been finding incredible opportunities. Now, net-net stocks are those stocks, and they tend to be very small companies. You only see larger companies trading at these levels during uh, you know, the 2003, 2009 type of situation. But their stocks, we take all the net current assets, add them all up, subtract out all debt and preferred liabilities. The number that's left over is the net current asset value. Now, if you can buy that at 75, 80% of the total market capitalization, you've got yourself a bargain. This was Ben Graham's basic investment approach for what he called enterprising investors, and he did very, very well with it over a couple of decades. Now, if you look at the current literature on the subject, uh, one of the best books out, out in a while was... Um, Mr. Wen uh, Mr. Wendell's book on uh, called the net current asset approach to investing, Victor Wendell uh, out of St. Louis, Missouri, um, and he found that if you looked at if you own these stocks from 1951 all the way up through the end of 2009, and you stayed fully invested unless there were less than 10, and then you broke it up into 10 percent increments, held cash for the balance of that, from 1951 to 2009, you earned 19.8 percent annually often with as much as 60 and 70 percent of your portfolio in cash. These stocks can be powerful performers. Um, Tobias Carlisle over at Greenback.com did a study and he looked at the period from 1983 to 2008 and he found that a portfolio of net net stocks outperformed the broader market by a whopping 22 percent a year. Uh, they're perceived as risky. In fact, they're really not that risky. These companies literally can be liquidated for more than the total market cap. Um, when we find them, we just simply buy them. We add it to three in the portfolio. We have five right now in the portfolio. Uh, we expect decent returns out of those over the next couple of years because there's a huge margin of safety in the balance sheet, and they're just extraordinarily cheap. I don't care what the market is doing. If I can find them, I'll buy them. As a bonus, at market tops, I can't find too terribly many, and at market bottoms, I can find dozens of them. So uh, it's kind of a natural market timing effect to following the net net stocks. The other thing we're still very much involved in is the small community banks and what I call the trade of the decade. We're still finding several high-quality stocks, great balance sheets, excellent financial condition, trading in around 80% of book value or so. Um, it's a bonus. The industry is slowly recovering. The balance sheets are improving. Even at the smaller banks, we're not seeing very many bank failures or closures. Only 16 so far this year, I believe. Um, it's a lot of high-quality banks, and they're starting to share the wealth with shareholders, I guess. We're buying bank stocks that are very well-run institutions at you know around 80% of book value, and these guys are actually raising their dividends and instituting stock buybacks to take advantage of what they see as the same severe underpricing that we see. It's the trade of the decade. It's still very much alive. Um, the bank merger and consolidation wave is starting to happen. We've seen about 100 deals so far this year. A lot of those were really tiny, non-public banks doing deals with each other, but there's been plenty of public deals too, and the average price is right 
right around 130% of book value right now. So far in the last year, in our Banking and Profits newsletter, we've uh, been fortunate enough to have four of those deals hit our portfolio, and our average gain has been well north of 20 of 40%. We're going to see more of those in the years ahead. The other place that we've found some bargains is in the small REITs, and I've talked about this a little bit before. The larger REITs have been bid up, uh, with multifamily being one of the hottest asset classes, same as student housing, um, being very, very hot. They've been bid up to one and a half, two times book value and even higher, and the dividend yields are sub 4% in many cases. It's, I don't see any point owning a REIT at that level. We've been able to find some names that are in multifamily housing that are trading at less than 80% of book value, and we even found a student housing-related REIT that was trading for less than 80% of book value. Now, t one of the REITs does not pay a dividend. It's more of just a pure asset play. Um, but the other two are both yielding over 7.5%. Now, in a world where a 10-year treasury is 2.5%, I think that's a pretty good deal. So that's really where the market has come down to for us. Net net stocks, small banks, and small REITs. Um, expect to see more bargains in the energy sector as time goes on as well. Um, I think there'll be some anti-fracking kickback that'll create greater bargains in that area uh, during the uh, balance of the year. That's where we're focusing our attention. It's been working pretty well so far, so we're going to stick with it. All right, it's been a pretty good week. My Baltimore Orioles have been playing some fantastic baseball, 6-4 and four in their last 10, beating the Boston Red Sox right now. Um, we're back in first place by a game and a half. Let's hope we can stay there for the rest of the year. Wouldn't that be nice? But have to say that if I was going to put money down on a team to win the World Series right now, it's going to be the Oakland A's. They were already one of the best teams in baseball, and they traded away some young talent, but they got Jason Hamill and – Jeff Samarja uh, with his sub-3 ERA from the Chicago Cubs, and I think that has to make them the odds-on favorite to win, to go to and win the World Series this year, unless those two guys just have epic, spectacular collapses. I don't see that happening. Not much happening on the book front this week. Uh, only a couple new releases that even uh, of minor interest, but there's a bunch of stuff coming out over the next three weeks that I'll be telling you about. And if you're a big recreational reader, like I am, um, I just finished... Don Brun's St. Bart's Breakdown. It's the second one of his rock and roll mysteries that I've read, and they are just a great, fun afternoon read. So if you like recreational reading as I do, you might want to take a look at that one. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. Working on a little summer cold down here. Uh, got a busy week coming up. We've got uh, the Fed minutes are coming out. Everybody's going to go over every period and comma and just kind of decide what they all meant. Uh, it doesn't really in the long run mean much of anything, but we're going to dissect it and it could possibly move the market anyway. Uh, we've got the regular jobless claim numbers. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like two or three Fed officials are going to be allowed to wander out loose among an unsuspecting public and give speeches. That's always a potentially market-moving event. So we've got earnings season. Uh, we've got a couple of economic reports that could shake things up, and it looks like we've got a great week ahead of uh, of baseball and of course it looks like I think the World Cup finishes up this week so maybe we can now put that all the way behind us and be done with World Cup chatter for the year anyway this is Tim Melvin coming to you from down here in rainy central Florida and we'll talk to you guys next week